Hello, I'm Erica Harmon, Manager of Archives and Records at Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site. Welcome to Artifacts After Dark, a special presentation of artifacts from our collection streaming live from Cell Block 7 during night tours. The Artifacts After Dark program is a mashup celebrating Archives Month, which is all of October, as well as Eastern State's night tours, which will be available from 6 p.m. on select nights through November 15th. For more information, check out our website or the video that will be posted directly after this live stream. Before we begin, I want to assure our viewers that although I am not wearing a mask for the purpose of this live stream, Eastern State is strictly following city and state protocols for COVID-19, and that I'll be popping my mask right back on as soon as we wrap up so that our members in the audience can come and take a closer look at the objects and ask me any additional questions they may have. This week's Artifacts After Dark theme explores interactions between Eastern State Penitentiary with the world outside its walls, as well as what the relationships between incarcerated people, their families, and the outside community look like today. Let's get started. During its early years, people incarcerated at Eastern State were supposed to have no contact with one another, relatives, friends, or receive news of the outside world. <laughs> The penitentiary's revolutionary radial design and system of mandatory solitary confinement were supposed to inspire penitence, or true regret, in the hearts of people convicted of a crime. As a result, prisoners could only be visited by penitentiary employees, members of the Board of Inspectors, official dignitaries, religious representatives, and members of the Pennsylvania Prison Society, the organization that founded Eastern State. These relatively few visitors likely provided a welcome relief to the silence enforced here from the building's opening in 1829 through 1913 when separate confinement was officially abandoned. In 1856, a prisoner gifted this miniature cutlery set that he made from the bones in his soup to Marianna Kane. Marianna, a child at the time, visited the prison with her father who was a member of the prison society. The Pennsylvania Prison Society, known in the 18th and 19th centuries as the Philadelphia Society for Alleviating the Miseries of Public Prisons, is still active today. Their mission is to advocate for humane prisons and a rational approach to criminal justice. Although their visits have been limited as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, officials from the society still go to prisons to address issues and concerns raised by incarcerated people, family and friends, to ensure a more just and transparent criminal justice system. It's not clear exactly when administrators of Eastern State began allowing the exchange of mail between incarcerated people and their loved ones. However, in 1845, Eastern State's board president wrote that the progress made in educating the prisoners was very satisfactory and in many instances, truly astonishing. Prisoners who on reception were unable to read or write have within a year been enabled to address letters to their families. The Pennsylvania State Archives has some letters written to and from prisoners in 1845 in their collection. Over here is the oldest letter written by a prisoner in our collection. It is from 1894. Today, prisoners can send and receive emails but the process of sending physical mail to someone incarcerated in Pennsylvania is still difficult. In September of 2018, the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections changed its mail policy, citing the threat of liquefied drugs being sent through paper mail. Now, mail sent to an incarcerated person from family and friends first goes to a private facility in Florida, run by a corporation called Smart Communications. From there, it is scanned and sent digitally to the Pennsylvania prison where the recipient is housed. The recipient gets a printed copy of the photos, illustrations, postcards, and all of their types of personal mail sent to them, and they never see the original. For someone like me, who really enjoys the textures of all of these old items and paper, not being able to receive and touch an actual greeting card would be extremely disappointing. For example, getting to hold this greeting card sent by the Pennsylvania Prison Society to all of the prisoners in honor of 1885's New Year is really cool. In 
In 1858, the Board of Inspectors noted that nearly 37,000 people visited Eastern State Penitentiary over the course of five years. This number did not include prisoners, family, and friends. Visitors shared their experiences of Eastern State via letter, postcard, and stereoscope cards. Eastern State has examples of each of these in its collection. Here we have an example of a letter that was written by a visitor to Eastern State while it was still under construction. The letter includes a diagram of Eastern State and a description of how it will operate once complete. Over here, we have a stereoscope card from the late 1800s. Cards like these have a 3D effect when viewed through a special pair of glasses. They're basically an older version of the Viewmaster toys that were popular in the 1980s. And finally, we have postcards from the early 1900s. This one here is addressed to France and is postmarked from Philadelphia. In the center of the table, we have several guidebooks from the 19th century that recommend Eastern State as a tourist destination. The entry in one of these books concludes by saying, Tickets of admission can be had on application to any of the inspectors. The board president takes pleasure in giving any information in his power respecting this truly noble institution, which we assure the reader is well worthy of a visit. We have an example of just such a ticket issued by the inspectors from 1885 over here. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, prison administrators attempted to curb public visitors. They noted that it was improper for men, women, and children to wander through the corridors out of idle curiosity. At the same time, administrators increasingly formalized the process of visiting an individual incarcerated here. In 1904, they published a notice stating, a family pass is given with the expectation that the members of the family will visit the said institution together. Visitors are allowed every three months, except in emergencies, when more frequent visits are allowed. This book over here, from the 1940s, states that blood relatives could visit once every 15 days. At the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections stopped all in-person visits, replacing them with video visitation. When I read through the video visitation guide issued by the Department of Corrections, Items that particularly stood out to me are the regulations relating to the presence of children on the video calls. All minors under 18 years of age must have a form signed by both the parent or legal guardian of the child and the prisoner's counselor or unit manager before the minor will be placed on the prisoner's visitor list. Incarcerated parents are not permitted to sign these forms. A parent or guardian must also be present with the minor for the duration of the video call. Officers monitor all visits and are permitted to end the visit if rules are violated. I don't know much about children visiting incarcerated family members at Eastern State in the later 20th century. I've read through dozens of interviews with men once held here, and I can't remember a single mention about visits from children. If families did visit in the 1960s, they would have used this visitation room, which is currently closed to historic site visitors due to the COVID-19 pandemic but we look forward to opening it again as soon as it is safe to do so. While we don't know much about children visiting specific prisoners, in addition to Mariana Kane, whom I mentioned earlier, other children visited the prison in general groups or with their fathers who were guards or staff members. On Christmas day of 1900, the warden wrote, <clears throat> in the morning, 50 children from the foster home were here and sang their Christmas carols, which were appreciated by the inmates. Elsie McKenty, whose father was warden in the 1920s, talks about how she would roller skate through the cell blocks and how she was tutored by a prisoner she called Nanny. Some of Elsie's memories can be heard on our self-guided audio tour. Here we have a photo of the McKenty family in the prison. I'm not sure which of these young ladies is Elsie though. On the opposite side of the table, Glenn Hyatt is pictured getting a shave from a barber incarcerated at Eastern State. Glenn's father was a psychologist for the prison and, like many children of the staff, got his haircuts inside the prison. 
Today, a few programs help keep families impacted by incarceration connected. Stories Alive at the Free Library offers incarcerated parents the opportunity to read books with their children, somewhere other than traditional visiting rooms. Using live video conferencing set up in the prison and in neighborhood libraries, families gather to read, talk, sing, and spend time together. The video visit takes place via computer screens, similar to Skype or FaceTime, and free books and library cards are given to families who participate. This program has likely been impacted by COVID-19. In 2018, the Children's Museum of Manhattan began hosting family visits with mothers incarcerated at Rikers Island in New York City. The program was piloted with, a, with small groups of incarcerated women and, like everything else, has undoubtedly been impacted by COVID-19. Incarcerated women selected by the jail spend a few hours at the Upper West Side Museum with their kids while it is closed to the public. Meeting at the museum sets a different tone for families than what is possible at the jail's visitation room. In 1842, Charles Dickens famously wrote of his disapproval of Eastern State's system of separate confinement. He said, I hold this slow and daily tampering with the mysteries of the brain to be immeasurably worse than any torture of the body. Many studies have since shown that the prolonged absence of human interaction is in fact harmful. Knowing that, I'll leave you with a couple of questions to consider and respond to in the comments. First, what opportunities should incarcerated people have to interact with the outside world? Second, what opportunities should people on the outside be given to interact with prisons and jails and the people who live and work within them? I believe we have a few minutes to take questions from our live member audience, followed by those of folks watching from home. Live members, do you have any questions you would like to ask? What are the other books you have? These other books, these are all tour, tour books um, that mention Eastern State, and I will pick one out. I forget uh, which one this is. This one is McGee's Illustrated Guide to Philadelphia, and um, it's got a very nice uh, page on the inside with some illumination. And then I actually thought ahead to bookmark the page that talks about Eastern State. And it's got a lovely engraving there with a, with a horse carriage in the front. And um, each of these books does mention Eastern State. And most of, um, yeah, all of them are from the mid to late 1800s. Any other questions? So the one we have on the stand over there, is it, so was Eastern State part of, or somehow incorporated into the Centennial, Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition and the whole, all of the things they did around that? Right. Um, in case you weren't able to hear, the question was about this book about the Centennial. Um, Eastern State did not have a booth at the Centennial, so uh, we weren't represented in the facility, but the book includes various places in the city of interest that visitors would want to check out while they were here for the exhibition. Erica, could you tell us about the bookends that are holding, your, holding our, our uh, kind of books? Sure thing. These bookends, um, I hope you can see them on the camera, are some of my favorite things in our collection. These are shaped to look like the original front door that was torn down in the late 1830s. So every visitor and um, person employed here, person incarcerated here, would have gone through these gates when they arrived at Eastern State up until the late 1930s. And um, part of what gives it its weight is one of the bolts from the door. So when the, when the door was torn down, the bolts that held all the wood together were salvaged for various um, purposes, including these bookends. So cool. Really good. <laughs> Any other questions? Do we have any questions from our online viewers? Not currently. Okay, well I guess that wraps it up for today. Thank you again for attending Artifacts After Dark at Night Tours Online, and thank you to our members for attending in person. I'll be back with a different set of artifacts from Eastern States Past next week at 7 p.m. I look forward to seeing you then. A video with more information about visiting Eastern State at night will be posted directly after this. Have a great evening.